make one answer now. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, uh, there are two things I I I don't uh, uh, two or three things I don't I don't remember how many, <laughs> but there are a few. Uh, one is that it is officially the last lecture of our course, yes, and I would like you to send your comments, criticisms, and or or, or, or suggestions uh, that what should we do for the next time. It will be either in two years or three, three years time. And second thing is that they, uh, they, there will be a lecture um, uh, by Rosberg, Rosberg Paradigm yes, on purification, crystallization, and structural analysis of uh, respiratory uh, complex one from Thermos Thermophilus on this th Thursday at 4 o'clock. Uh, although it is not part of our course, but it can be considered as a crystallography case study. So I, I would recommend you to come and to, to, to be active in that particular lecture, okay? Um, that's our last lecture, right. making pretty pictures, yes. and I thought that it could be very fun lecture, yes. should be okay. So Don't disappoint us, okay? Okay, no. no, no. <laughs> 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 so, uh, at the beginning of the course, I, 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 I went to Gareth and said, oh, we should also have a, a lecture on, on how to make figures, because you spent years doing your research, getting a crystal structure, and then you got one moment to capture somebody's attention, right? You got that one figure in a paper, or that one figure on your presentation. So you better do a really good job. But nobody tells you how to do it, and it's quite, quite difficult at times. But, um, so, in the, in, in the beginning of the, the uh, lecture series, um, no, it's not really working. Jan Lover put up this list of, of steps. Um, why isn't it going back? Okay, uh, of, of things to do. And then I, so he forgot to make the figures and the right paper. But I also put up, um, you know, what's the work distribution? And so at the beginning, this is mainly your work. Um, and then everything else, you probably get help from other people. But then suddenly at the end, while the boss is writing the paper, he tells you to go and make the figures, and you're suddenly left on your own again. So this is another part where you, you actually have to figure out what to do. Um, and this is what I said before. You've got that one chance to capture somebody's attention, to get the message across. Because you can make lots of lots of figures, but some of them are not really easy to understand. So there you go. You make a, a figure. You choose the prettiest colors that you can imagine. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> you send it to the paper, and suddenly it turns out like this. And you wonder, well, hang on, that was not the way I made it. So this is a common uh, mistake, confusion, is that um, this is what's going on. There's two color modes in many illustration programs. Um, this is really not working. So one of them is red, green, and blue, RGB. So this is for TV screens, computer screens. This is an additive color. So if you, uh, what you do is you emit light, and you add more light to it. Printers, journals, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, it's different, it's, it's uh, what is it, um, construct, no, deconstructive. So here, uh, ink, well, sorry? Subtractive. Subtractive, that's the one, it's actually here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you've been thinking about it. You know, yeah. <laughs> so what happens when you have something printed, light goes into it and some of it will be absorbed and the rest is, is released uh, or scattered. So as you add more and more color, it becomes darker, while an additive, RGB, is more bright. And that's what's going on here. So when you're preparing your figures in Pymol or whatever you use, and then you put, send them off to your, your, um, uh, the, the journal, you know, choose colors that don't change much when you go from RGB to CMYK. And actually in Pymol, you can choose to go into CMYK mode immediately, so you already know what you're going to get. And then when you put them into Illustrator, for instance, you also can choose it to be CMYK mode, so you know what your figure is going to look like when it's finally published. Um, and you, you avoid this... Um, um, Disappointment. There's another color uh, mode, which is it's basically also RGB, but it's, it's uh, slightly different. It's actually very handy. So it's hue, saturation, and brightness, where the hue is just where you are in the color wheel. So you can choose any color you like. Saturation is then how, you, how bright it is, or sorry, how, how intense the color is. So as you go outwards, you get a more deep color. And then the brightness is in the third dimension, makes it a bit more darker. This is really useful if you want to make you know, shades of different colors. It's more difficult if you work in CMYK mode and you want to go from one purple to another purple because you have to think about all the four colors. So sometimes it can be quite confusing. Um, this is much easier if you do illustration, but it doesn't always 
you can't always use it if you make a figure. Um, but those are basically the three um, color modes. Now, the journals are not always that friendly because some of them say, all color artwork must be submitted in CMYK. Tells you a little bit more. Please consult a local graphics expert. <laughs> if you don't. So yeah, there's the divisional aids, uh, divisional is it? Visual aids uh, up there somewhere. Um, they're extremely knowledgeable about all these programs, and they can always help you, uh, or you ask somebody else, or you just experiment. There's a lot of stuff on the internet as well. Um, but then another journal says color figures must be prepared in RGB, not in CMYK. So look carefully, look at the things. Another confusing thing is that sometimes. When you submit your, your paper for the first time, it goes to, to the reviewers who get it maybe in the RGB. You make a PDF, they get it there. But then when it's finally printed, it's going to be in CMYK again. So carefully look at what you're dealing with, because it, the initial submission may be in RGB, while the final submission has to be in CMYK. Um, so if you don't want to get confused. And just to illustrate that this is not just a random example, you often find figures like this, where you can clearly see that that probably wasn't the intended color. That's very typical for going from RGB to CMYK, where everything looks a little bit more dull. Um, all right, so that's, that's a bit disappointing if, you've, if that, those were not the colors that you've chosen. Um, so in PyMol, you can choose, you go to display color space CMYK, or you can type it in the command line. Um, I'm sure you can do it in other programs as well. I'm not familiar with CCP4MG, but I'm sure there's other things you can do there too. Um, um, in Photoshop, you can choose the Illustrator. In PowerPoint, not so much. You don't set up the whole file, but you can choose in different modes. So if you go to the different slider, uh, color sliders, you can choose what you want to do. So there's again that HSB, so hue, saturation, and brightness, and CMYK and RGB. So that um, allows you to, to choose something that's more um, useful. Um, another thing I got suddenly worried, and I'll, I'll stop doing that, <laughs> is that there's a lot of colorblind people. Um, I think it's about 1% of the Western male population is colorblind. So if you submit a, uh, your, your figures to a reviewer that's colorblind and you've chosen colors that are not compatible, um, you may piss them off. So I started worrying about it and then I realized it's really difficult to work with colorblindness. So then I forgot about it again and now I just choose pretty pictures. Uh, but basically there's three forms of colorblindness. And for those who are not colorblind, this is what they may see. So red and green um, are not very contrasting to them, so they look the same. And, and red and green are often used in things like microarrays or cells, <coughs> and so for them they can't appreciate it at all. So what you can do is if you choose your colors, and even if they might, for a colorblind person, um, not be dis distinguishable, put another color in between. Right? So you can still choose the bright colors that you want, but then make sure that there's something in contrasting in between. Um, so that they can at least appreciate the domain definitions rather than it looks like one continuous domain. Um, so this is uh, basically a color spectrum. It's quite sad that they only can see blue and, and yellow, but you can work with it a bit. Um, so there's a nice website. Where was it? I thought I'd put it up there. Um, oh, here it is. Um, so they actually, they propose, you know, what colors could you use that are contrasting even for a colorblind person um, and that are also useful for a, a, a visual person. Again, I stopped worrying about it because I was too much trouble, but um, might be worthwhile. So you got your pretty pictures, and you know, so when you're doing presentations like this, it's RGB, so you can get the most colorful things that you want to. So stick in RGB, um, but then you need to worry about resolution in itself as well, so pixels and stuff. Um, so this is a figure, and, and when you render in PyMol, you can define how many pixels you want your figure to be at. So in this case, I said 400 times 400, and it's a small figure, it's only 100 KB or so. But it looks pretty terrible on display, which is a shame, because when you look at your computer screen, it may look very nice, but then it's, it's played out in, in several meters, and it looks terrible. So think about it when you're doing that. So this is 600 DPA, or 600 by 600 pixels, and that's uh, 900. So now it looks a lot better. The file size has only increased or by four or so. So it's not too bad. But that's something that you, you know, if you have a presentation, take that presentation and actually view it in a, in a screen like this so you know what you're going to get. Uh, otherwise, it looks a bit um, amateuristic if you don't have a high, Even this, you can put higher resolution on it if you wanted to. Um, now, pixels are not the only thing. What actually determines resolution is the pixels per inch or dots per inch, which is what DPI stands for. So this is the same figure, but then made smaller and smaller. So while this 
tail looks pretty horrendous here. As you make it smaller, it, it looks a lot smoother here. Um, so when you're preparing figures for a journal, you need to know how big is it going to be and what's the resolution that I need. And then you determine that it says that I need so many pixels. Um, so that's here, for instance. Uh, journal often give you the, the chance to either do one column wide, two column wides, or sometimes one and a half column wides. So that tells you that's three and a half inch. It's say 300 DPI. So that tells you I need 1,050 pixels if I want one column. If I want the two columns, I need double that. So when you make your figure and you render it in, in Pymal, you can say, you know, I want 2,000 pixels wide so that your figure is going to fit beautifully. If you go higher resolution, if you go to 400 DPI, the printer won't discriminate to that anymore. So you just increase your file size. But visually, the printer can't make it any finer. Um, yes? Am I allowed to interrupt? Yes, of course. Do you think it makes a difference, 2,100 uh, to 2,160? Or 2,000? Between is the extra 60 pixels going to make a difference? Oh, no, no, no. It's just I didn't want to, you know, 7.2 times 300 adds to that number. Uh, OK. I was wondering if there's a question of, what's the word, interpolation? Because if they're going to make it 2,160 wide and I give them 2,100, they're going to have to move each pixel by a six, well, by a fraction. And in the end, I'll come to that in the next slide, they do whatever they want to. but. <laughs> <laughs> it's really annoying. But if, if your goal is to get a page white figure, think about the number of pixels you want or you need in order to make it look beautiful. Because if you do, you make a figure at 300 dpi, you think, oh, that's enough. Um, but then you stretch it out and suddenly the result is 100 dpi, it will look pretty awful. Um, but the other way around, if you make something like 600 dpi, you increase the file sizes. And some of the journals say we can only upload one megabyte of, of data. So then you have to figure out a way to deal with that. Um, the exception is if you have line figures, so if you have a graph from uh, whatever, and, and binding essay, they need to be a very high resolution. A way around it is if you actually submit it in Illustrator, which is a vectorial program, not a bitmap program, but I'll come to that in a bit. So think about that. It's very easy, actually. If you, if you just think about how big does it need to be, I need at least 300 dpi. Um, that means I need so many pixels. Quite easy. So this is what editors then do, you, you submit the figure and then they say, well, too bad, I'll just make it smaller anyway. And you think, oh, well, okay, maybe they were, because when you make it this smaller, you also make it smaller this way, so probably they needed the space. So you get really annoyed, if then you see at the end of the paper, there's all this space. <laughs> 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 but, you know, because they are a little bit unpredictable, um, also the fonts that you, you use, well, it's not very clear here, it was a screenshot, but the fonts that you use, they say you need, like, font 16 or so, font size. Um, sometimes I see people, they prepare a figure in A4 wide, because they want to be very big, with fonts that you can read. But then it's going to be squeezed into a tiny figure that's going to be uh, in, in um, portrait. And suddenly your fonts are going to be tiny, and you can't read them. And so the again, labels are re in wrongly. Yes, that's an option. So while you're at it, make a figure in the size that you want it to be. Don't make it bigger because the editor will just crop it into something that will fit in their columns. Um, and then you might, you know, your, your figure gets less interpretable. And again, you miss the message because somebody might get annoyed. So yeah, I can't read that. Fuck it. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, no. no sorry. <laughs> yes. OK. After. Um, so now a little bit on, on the, there are two types of, of imaging processing programs. One of them is using vector-based images where basically anything is described as a mathematical equation or so. So there's a line going up and there's another line going right. Um, and then there's the, the bitmap or pixel base, um, like Photoshop and, and, and others, which everything is in, in dots. And when you zoom in, you see the difference. So this you can scale up as much as you want. This pixelated is actually because of the projector. Uh, it's not because of this. But, but so but things like Illustrator and even PowerPoint, you can enlarge as much as you like without losing resolution. Uh, that doesn't work for these guys. Um, so TIFF format or PNG format or JPEG are all pixelated. JPEG is a bit scary um, because it also distorts the image. You can see this gray fuzziness. It's because it's doing a reduction of however it's doing. So you start off from a TIFF, you convert it into JPEG, and it gets actually very fuzzy. 
That's okay if you have photographs. So many digital cameras have uh, JPEGs as, store, as, as, as file format. That's fine. But if you do something with, with the line drawing, that's actually not a good format. So that's why you want to save it in the a PNG format. TIFF tends to be a bit more um, memory consuming. So if you have a large file in a TIFF format, it's quite, um, quite heavy. It easily goes up to megabase if it's big. Uh, Ping is a little bit smaller. Again, JPEG is not a good idea uh, for most applications. So that's another choice you need to make when you're preparing your figures. Um, so what is nice about Illustrator and, and, and another pro so PowerPoint is not an acceptable uh, program to submit your figure in. Most journals say, I don't want PowerPoint. Um, and most like Illustrator. So we've got it here, you might as well use it. Um, and I think they're giving now courses on Illustrator because it's quite a scary program to use it for us because it's got so many options and you don't know what you're doing. Um, but it's worthwhile because it's, it's very versatile. Um, so if you, for instance, if you, have a, a common, if you have a figure where you have some pictures of your molecule and you want to show an enzymatic assay that you did to show that the mutant was dead, in Illustrator you can have that bitmap based picture of your figure and then a, a, a vector based illustration of the activity assay without losing the resolution. So that's really nice. Photoshop wouldn't be able to do that because Photoshop is, is a bitmap or pixel based uh, program. So then you have to increase the resolution to 600 or so or 2000, which is ridiculous. All right. So now when you prepare a figure, um, you want to label things also accordingly. And there's many different ways of doing it. Some of them are more clear than others. Um, so what is useful in this case is that all the information about the different domains is on screen, so you only have to look once. Um, but it can be a bit cluttered. In this case, there aren't too many. So in other cases, you can use color coding to put it away and say, OK, but then you, you ask people to look back for and forth. Um, but it's still OK. What is not OK is if you have a description, which you often find in figures in a paper, where everything is written here, down there, which is really, yeah, it takes time. And if you're reading a paper, you just want to glance through it. You don't want to go through that trouble. Um, and then, of course, you have to colorblind people. So in this case, if your colors are contrasting enough for colorblind people, you don't have to call the names. You just say, that's the PHP domain, that's the thumb domain, and it's easy enough for them to see. This one, it will be impossible, because they don't know what sign looks like. Um, so another thing is, when you want to look at an active site, um, you put some uh, residues that are involved, and then you need to choose how to display them. And Sorry for this. So in default mode, in Pymo in this case, I'm not familiar with CCP4MG or other programs. So when you say show sticks, then it will automatically also show the side chain. In this case, also when I rendered it, um, it starts projecting all kinds of shadows, which give additional things that you might not want to see. Um, to highlight it, you can then maybe choose another color. Um, but then uh, another crazy stuff happens. You can then uh, take away the side or the main chain, but then it still has this funny coloring. So it's much nicer, at least in my opinion, if you have just a single side chain, no main chain, and the coloring can be either that or, or the same way. And it's much calmer to look at. Um, another thing is, when you look at an active site, you have no re relationship to, to the whole molecule. So you easily lose um, you know, what, what you're actually showing. So it's very easy if you just put some in the corner of your slide, uh, a little, uh, the, the whole view with, with the area that you're looking at. So it makes it much more easier to, for people to understand. Um, now also, you noticed how all the different cartoons popped up in different modes. I find that really annoying. <laughs> so. If you want to show different things, I like to just simply appear them and not use all these little tools that they zoom in, fly in, etc. Um, so what I just did now, I'd never do in the normal presentation. Um, so for in, in Pymo, in order to, to get this single, um, and also you can do it in different colors, what you need to do is to create a separate, separate object for your side chains, and then you can color them any way you want without affecting the backbone, like so. Um, I don't like to show the main chain because it's just distracting. You know, there's no additional information there, but there's extra information. I mean, it's just more visual stuff to see it. Um, I don't think that having shadows like this is any useful. It looks fancy, but it's, not, it's just confusing the picture. Um, and so I don't like the fancy intros, just make things appear without uh, doing stuff. 
So the only time I think having shadows is useful is when you have a surface representation, when you have a cavity, because the, the shadows will emphasize the location of the cavity, which may not be apparent if you don't have any shadows. But for things like this, uh, or the details, I think shadows are just confusing. Um, now, when you finally want to conclude something, um, you have two different ways. One of them, you use the structures and you make something that is, to me, completely uninterpretable. <laughs> and I know these proteins, but to me they look like... I had to think a long time before I could re recognize what the, sh what, what the bits were. And that's somebody that knows the protein. So somebody who doesn't know the protein is completely lost. You just see blobs with faint colors, and there must be DNA there, but what's this, etc. So in some cases, although you, you spend all your time determining a high-resolution figure or the structure, it's fine if you then reduce it to something that's really easy to see. This just captures it, the same message, but in a very simple way. Did you make this figure? Yes. <laughs> These were done in Illustrator once? These were done in Illustrator. But the first one I, I, I did by hand. I just literally took colouring pencils and... So you've got some sort of shading going on here and you've got some highlights. Yes. Is that something that you did or was it put in by the program? No, that's visual aids. <laughs> 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 so I made, I made the, 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 the you template. You the back of the uh, envelope. <laughs> I, uh, kind of. I, I made my first attempt in Illustrator and then I took it to Visual Aids because it took me too long. And, and so they made these nice little holes that were just a blob for me and a little bit of shading. Um, so that was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just gives it a little Delegation. touch. Yes. Delegation. Yes. Important. But you know, <laughs> they're, they're here to help us, I think. <laughs> is, is that right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Another way is sometimes the structure can be really, really complicated. And this is correct. This is the structure. Well, even this is an interpretation of the structure. But you get completely confused. So to have a more simplified version of it helps you understand. And then when you talk about domain A in the text, it's obvious what, what A is and A prime, etc. It's much easier. And then you can go, if you're really interested, to look here. But this may be interpretable for structural biologists, but you also want to reach the biologist who's now interested in alpha helices and, and, and beta strands. And to have this is much easier to see. And sometimes it's also fine if you just get some coloring pens and draw it out on a piece of paper. Um, it's, it, it's much faster and it's just as clear. So, um, OK, now a little bit on movies. One of the things that I always find surprising is somebody has a movie and then they go like, oh, okay, let me see and start it. And then they click and then finally the movie starts and then there's this little hand in the middle of the movie, <laughs> right? It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. You can just have it start automatically. There's a function in, in PowerPoint that will let you start it automatically or you can have it start on, on, on when you hit the space bar. So you don't have to do that. Another thing is that if you make a movie, you can do that in many different ways. Put some pauses in it, because if you set up a movie that runs and you have all the information, you know, you need to be damn sure that you know all the words. And the problem is, once you've defined a way of following the movie with your words, two, three months later, you have to give the talk again. You lost all the words, and, and you're stuck, and, and suddenly, oh, oh, forgot this. So if you introduce a pause, you can get to the end, and then you go to the next bit. It's much easier. So you can either do that um, when you make the movie, where you make separate bits, or if you have made a movie, it's one, one long, long movie, you can use uh, uh, programs like QuickTime Pro to then extract the frames that you want and say that's part one, that's part two, and part three. And that makes it much easier for you to talk. It will give you a lot of rest uh, as you go through the talk. Um, so this is the bit that I tried to include. Sorry, it was a little bit late. But uh, in PowerPoint, there's something like movies, then timing, and then you can say start on click or start with the previous. So start with the previous will mean that when you go to that slide, it will automatically start the movie. Or start on click, it means that you'll go to the, 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 the slide, it's a still image, and then you click, and it goes on. But you don't have to move that mouse and, and have the hand sitting in there. Um, and it's a bit short, but with that, I came to the end. So um, there's a pretty picture. <laughs> Very simple. All right, that's it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. It was, I think, the shortest selection of our course, but it was very, very useful. Yes, yes. Now, any questions? Yes. 
Would you ever show a stereo picture now? Even in supplementary. Do you think they're ever useful? I, I like staring in stereo, yeah, but I do but, too, but I don't think anybody else does. No. Well, you do, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> How many people can see stereo here? One, two, oh, that's quite few. So it is useful. Yeah. I I, I did it in in two thousand six we still had a stereo image, yeah. Which way do the journals want you to put the stereo pictures if if any way? Wall eye or cross eye? I do wall eyes. Wall eye wall Wall is it wall 60 millimeter separation, which is yes, about the yes. high separation. Because I can do it without the, the tools, yeah, I can just stare at it. Yeah. yeah. Don't you find cross eyes about 10 times easier? No. Only <laughs> 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 oh, seven. <laughs> okay. There's, there's yes, something on movies. Well, you, one thing you can do is three images. Right. Well, I was the <laughs> I, I've not seen that, but I've not been looking in journals. I haven't before. seen that, though, but right, I know recently. it exists as a possibility. Right. Okay. One one comment I make on, on colouring is one useful technique when you want to when you've got lots of domains and things and you're only interested to highlight one is you, you wash out the ones that are not interesting in a sort of pale grey colour. Ah, you've got that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and highlight the highlight the things you do want to yeah. highlight in bright colours. As comments were come, he will show next slide, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> when do you choose to use cylindrical helices as opposed to cartoon representations? I, I'm not too clear about it myself, but sometimes, um, if in an overview, I think it can be useful because it's a bit less cluttered. Um, but these are an interpretation of a helix. So when, when a helix has a kink, and you show it as a, as a, as a or, you know, when the helix has a kink and you show it like a cylinder, it will be a straight line. So you lose that information. Um, and so if you then were to show a side chain and say this, kink, this helix is actually kinked a bit, um, then your side chain will be floating in space, which is very odd. Um, so I guess for, for an overview, it's a bit easier, less cluttered if you use cylinders. But if you zoom in to things, then having a ribbon diagram is a bit better. Yes. Primo has um, the side chain helper thing that kind of distorts the secondary structure sometimes to make right. it fit on the fit on the side chains. Do you think that's ever useful for them? Well, like that? well, actually, I think you, distorting is actually happening before that because when it makes a strand, it's an interpolation. It's it's a nice arrow that actually doesn't follow follow the main chain, and that's why you you have these these residues floating in space. So this one is actually floating in space. So when it says sidechain helper, it puts back, it follows the C-alpha trace, um, which is less clean, but is more accurate. But you can also, if you, if you rotate your image well enough, it's not so obvious. So in this case, the, this, this histidine is detached from the strand, but it's not so obvious because it's in the view that it's not obvious. If you were to, to rotate it a bit, then it will, there will be an obvious space. So you can fiddle a bit. I was wondering, um, if you were exporting mm -hmm. a graph, for instance, from a uh, prism, mm -hmm. what, what dictates whether it's yeah, better yeah, or um, um, <laughs> So, um, Is it what you're pasting into, or what it's coming from? No, so prism is already a vector-based thing. So, um, so you can basically copy and paste from prism and directly paste it into to, um, Illustrator, and it will, will retain all the features. You can even select uh, a part of it, if you ungroup it, you can select an area and then make it thicker or redder or whatever you like. Um, you can also export it into P a PDF file, um, which PDFs are also um, uh, vector-based programs. Um, but then you can insert it into something like Photoshop. And, but when you do that, then Photoshop will, will uh, pixelate it. So is the, is the receiving program which determines whether it's a vector or a Yes. Yes. Well, obviously, if, if, if you start with a pixelated figure, it won't be vectorial, but yeah. Sorry. I was just going to say, on these schematic things, the cylinders or, or sheet strands, I don't know about Pymol, but in CC4MG, the default radius and the width of the, of, the, of the strands is a bit too thick, really, and you actually, you can control it. You can, yeah. I guess you can in Pymol as well. Yeah. And you might think that making your cylinders a bit narrower, your sheets, sheet strands a bit thinner, might help the clarity if you've got a very complicated picture, particularly. Yes, yes. So you, these are things you can, 
I'm sure in Pinewell, certainly yeah. in Cisper MG, you've got full control over all these things, and you can fiddle with it. No, the same here. Also, the, the thickness of, of the, the, the side chains, you can also adjust if you want to emphasize something. Or if you don't, then you can make the thinner. But then I wonder why I showed them at all. But, uh, well, yeah, you, but, yeah. You, but you can use that to emphasize some yes. things over, yes. over other things. Yes. Color of the residues that you've yeah. mutated differently from the ones you haven't, and yeah. all those sort of things. So that, uh, what format do the, uh, the journals this is, they mean, um, use for vector graphics? Many of them um, accept Illustrator. So, some, of them, <laughs> some of them, some of them accept GIMP. Uh, oh, so GIMP is not. not so, um, so, I, in your list, I would have added Inkscape. That's what I okay. use uh, for vector graphics manipulation programs, okay. the SVGs. Right. I don't, I'm unfamiliar with journals okay. using SVGs. Will you send you your uh, PDF or PowerPoint? Yes, or and, and no, I just did. So, what, what is it called? Inkscape. 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 All right, let's add it to it. While he's uh, uh, collecting his slides, please. I have another co comment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like don't so? know. I don't uh, know about Pymol. I'm uh, the inverse of you. Uh, I know a little bit about since before MG though. Um, yeah. And for I representing. Mean, I, 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 in with a K. K. With a K. <laughs> I'm making a K. For representing surfaces in particular, uh, ambient occlusion is a good way of showing the depth in surfaces. Okay. Rather than, or as well as shadows. Yeah, well, I, I guess the main message is that some default settings in, in these graphic programs are not necessarily the most useful ones. Mm. So if you if you use Pymo, you show a side chain, and then it will automatically cast a shadow um, and and do all kinds of things that in the end you may not want. So yeah, I think the shadows are too sharp. Yeah, but also they they they, they clutter the image, and and sometimes it, um, yeah. Um, one thing I didn't have time to include, but if you have... You had enough time. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just want to get out. If you want to compare structures, one way of doing it is, is overlaying them. But that's actually quite difficult to see. Now, if you have a presentation, you can actually morph between the two structures, and it will be much more obvious what's going on. Um, and there is the morphing server at Yale, if you just look for it. And you can submit your two structure, and it will interpolate structures that are in between. And then instead of having two overlaying structures, you actually have the moving. And it will become much more obvious, because our eyes are very susceptible for, for movement. Um, so that's a great way of showing structural differences between. So in that case, what, they'll give you 100 different intermediate PDB files, and you yes. make a surface, for example, of yes. each one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So indeed, you upload into your program you all the, the, the sequential PDBs, and then do that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So some, some journals for labels, they ask instead of for, say, point size, they ask for in metric, like 0.5 centimeters. Is, is there a software program that allows you to specify how big of labels are meant to be? Or in short, just printing stuff on it and measuring the root Well, <laughs> so no. So if, if you do it in Photoshop, then you, um, also an illustrator, actually. So you can, you can set your ruler units to centimeter or inches or pixels. Um, so if you set it to centimeters, and then both Photoshop and Illustrator, maybe Inkscape too, they have a ruler option. So if you're not sure what your size is, just um, say, then you place your pointer here, and you just draw a line, and it will then tell you what the, 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 the size is. And that will be a little window on the right. But then you have to know how big it's going to be printed mm -hmm. in the journal in the end. Well, that, that's again, when you, when you, for instance, create an Illustrator file, you start over the blank page, and you just define it to the size that you want your, your final figure to be. And then you can cram in all the figures that you got into that little space. But at least it keeps you realistic, because it makes you realize that you, you have a defined space. And then also your font size will be more realistic. And if you print it, you know, you, you're going to get the figure printed in the size that you actually intend it to be. And so in Illustrator and Photoshop, you can measure on screen. Yeah. Just mentioned for morphing, I don't know, uh, Chimera is also really simple and easy option for that. Because right. the scale server, I don't know. I feel like you don't really have to control that. I mean, I don't understand how, how they exactly do it. OK. Whereas if you do it yourself, you really can just everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. OK. Good option. Yes. All right. Um, any more questions, comments? <laughs> is black dead now as a background? 
I, there, there are still some people that really like it because it contrasts. But I, I, if you're in a dark lecture theatre and you, on top of that, put a dark black ground, it, it's not ideal. And certainly when you put it in a paper, um, I guess not happens anymore, but in the old days, when you take a copy of a black figure and you, you put it in a photocopier and it comes out completely dark, that's not very <laughs> useful. So uh, I like white backgrounds. For the most part, including with electron density. Do you do that anymore? Yes, I, I, I still, you, you can still get so a good put contrast. With white background and yeah. vinyl. Yeah, I, I, white background seems to be clear. But it's clear in print. So. Print, 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 not on a graphic screen. No, so when you work where black background is uh, fine, yes, when you do you manipulate your molecule, you could. But when you do a presentation, for example, mm -hmm. yeah, black background would be very, yeah. very, very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think yeah. the, uh, 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 no more comments, questions? No? Uh, let's thank. Uh, Mandev and all our lecturers. <laughs> 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 <laughs>